want to begin by, by thanking you all for closing out your week as, as, as usual with our, our 507 transportation seminar. It's an absolute pleasure to, to have all of you here with us today uh, for what is going to be simply an exceptional presentation. And, and so we're, we're very honored to, to welcome uh, Amar here as the, the CEO of Moonshadow Mobile um, for the first in our, our formal presentation series this quarter. Um, and we're gonna learn quite a bit today about the implications of uh, uh, computer science, the development of uh, large scale data archives and databases, and how we can turn this immense amount of information that we are starting to produce in the transportation domain into actionable decision making information. And we're going to get to hear some of this from the perspective of uh, not only a computer scientist, uh, but an entrepreneur as well. And, and so, so we could not be more honored to, that you were able to, to spend a few minutes with us today. And gosh, we'll go ahead and turn the floor over to you to, to share your prepared remarks, and, and then we'll, we'll transition into a discussion. So, so uh, take it away when you're ready. Uh, so yeah, thanks, David. And, and you know, thanks for inviting me to, um, to show to transportation engineering students um, and researchers what we're doing. So first, uh, you know, a very short background. And I also have with me here, uh, Vander. He is uh, actually on the East Coast. He's one of our um, sales and support engineers who um, work with DOTs and consulting engineers all the time on helping them how to use uh, the technology. So, so we're, um, we're actually close by. Uh, we're based in Eugene. Munchera Mobile is our company. Uh, we were founded in, 2020, in 2010. Um, we have developed a product called DB for IoT, the database for the Internet of Things. Um, it's a time series geospatial database engine. So our database technology works purely with data that is coming off of moving objects or is about moving objects. And we can do that. And because that database has been purpose built for this particular purpose, it is much more efficient in being able to store, visualize and analyze uh, the movement of, of objects. So our clients are transportation planners and engineers, uh, consultants, you know, departments of transportation, uh, public transit, um, you know, county, city, states, you know, all of that. Um, one of our biggest challenge, and that's actually one of the reasons I really like um, having the opportunity to, to present this to all of you guys and gals. Um, one of our biggest challenges is, the, is, is bridging the differences in knowledge between transportation engineers and planners. On the one hand, you know, our customers and the database, the big data, people on our end and what we really need going into the future are people who have who possess both both uh, skill sets so um <clears throat> quick quick overview connected vehicles mobile apps and infrastructure generate data about movement so connected vehicles generate information about their location as well as the timestamp of course the moment in time and you know, other variables, you know, the speed, the heading, you know, and a lot of other stuff. Same is the case for mobile devices. Um, most of you will have heard about location-based services, uh, mobile apps. They generate the same type of data and that's recorded. It's often sent into the cloud and it's available uh, for purchase for uh, analytics. And then of course you have infrastructure, you know, traffic lights, um, cabinets, cameras, uh, counting stations, you know, all of those things generate data about movement. Uh, the data is truly enormous. It is very, very large. You know, just, in, just an idea, you know, three trillion vehicle miles are driven per year. If you would record one record every 10 meters, you're talking about 500 trillion records a year. Um, if you want to look at things such as DSRC, you know, vehicle to vehicle communication, near misses, you're talking about 10 to 100 times larger than that. Um, if you want to do engine diagnostics, you know, you're, you're generating data at, you know, 100 times a second, you know, or in some cases more. 
So the data is, is very, very large. Um, so we work with, with data sets that are enormous. We currently have, uh, we currently process about 10 billion waypoints per day. Um, that was six weeks ago. We're currently at 50. Um, and if you look a year ago, um, we were doing 100 million waypoints a day. So the, also for us, the data that we ingest from aggregators is growing um, incredibly quickly. The, our system, DB4IoT, runs in the cloud. So what I'm showing here is all these different objects that generate data, send it up to the cloud. That can happen in real time. It can happen historically or it can be a mixed bag where some of the data goes in real time and some of it goes in later. The database engine can also run in the vehicle or in the infrastructure. And the way I envision this technology uh, developing is that the amount of data that's going to be generated in the future is so incredibly large that you could still send it into the cloud, but it would be too challenging to process all of it in the cloud. So what I what I envision, and we're surely not there yet, but what I envision, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the road is a is a system where cloud databases are asking objects, what have you been doing? Did you drive on this road on such and such time? Was it icy, yes or no? You know, so that's really um, as I as I see the future. So about our business model, um, we are what's called a platform as a service. So we take in data from data aggregators. Connected vehicle data is preloaded in our system. Uh, we run the servers. Um, a lot of it is actually running here, right here in Eugene. So our customers get a web login and they can run their analytics from a, from a web interface, but they don't have to deal with the, all the challenges that you have when you work with these databases and you need to um, process them. So we are what I refer to as a, as a core database engine developer. So we don't sit on top of a Postgres or an Oracle or a SQL Server or a Cassandra um, or God forbid, a MongoDB. Um, so we won't get into that. Uh, we are the database engine. Why? Why would why would anyone do that? Which investors have asked me um, many times. So what we realized um, uh, six years ago is that the amount of data from IoT devices would be so large that it would be very inefficient to use traditional database technologies for this. So the first thing that we do is we reduce the footprint of the data in memory to about 10% of what it would be in a traditional database engine. We structure the data such that we do not need to generate indices. The data is searchable in an efficient way um, from the moment it is ingested. Uh, why is this so important? Well, the data is so large that just moving it from disk to RAM can be very lengthy. And only if you reduce it can you, um, you know, get, it, get it into RAM quickly enough and start working with it. So that's the first piece, you know, reducing the size of the data. Um, a lot of people think that if you reduce the data, you know, you're using compression and it slows down the system. In our case, um, we speed up the, the ability to run queries against it. We actually don't even yet use compression. Uh, we use a variety of other technologies uh, to reduce sizes of the data. As a result, on, on a practical matter, you know, what does this mean? This means that we can take a database with a couple hundred million records and visualize that over a map in you know, 10 or 20 seconds. Um, again, what is the growth of the data? If I look, you know, one of the aggregators that we work with is a company called Weijo. Um, right now, this very moment, but it's a race. Right now, they have the best data uh, available. They have about 10 million vehicles in the US that uh, ping them every three seconds while moving. And they have this data available in real time. So if you assume that you know, 2020 is a, is a 1.0, this is our baseline, 
the way that I see it is that by 2028, you know, an, an organization like Weijo will have 10 times as many um, OEMs. They will have 100 times as much as many vehicles. Each vehicle will provide 80, you know, four, four times more data. There will be a lot more columns. And these are all multipliers. So what I expect is that just a company like Weijo will have 150x as much data as um, they have in 2020. And in 2020, pre-COVID, they were doing about, about 15 billion waypoints a day. So that presents an enormous problem. One of the things that we do at our end is we reduce the size of the data. And so we believe that we will be able to reduce the size of the data to, you know, by another, you know, 80, 90 percent over the next 80, uh, over the next eight years or so. So you're still going to end up with a, you know, an, a significant increase in the total volume of data. So this is what a billion uh, waypoints looks like. Actually, this is what a billion and a half waypoints look like. Um, so Weijo, this is Weijo data, and I'll, I'll be using them a lot. Um, the data here, every dot that you see is a vehicle giving its position at a moment in time, plus giving, giving us a number of other variables like heading speed, um, you know, trip length, you know, all kinds of other things. So uh, the data here in this case, this is a screenshot uh, from our db 4 IoT system. Um, it's visualized by <clears throat> speed. You can visualize it by any variable that's in the system. Um, and this is in kilometers per hour. Red is zero. Um, yellow is about 50 kilometers an hour. And green is 100. So what you can do, um, this is getting a little closer to home. This is Portland, of course. In our system, you can zoom in on any area um, and you can go even down to, you know, to really close in. And now you start seeing the dots um, and you see that there's spacing between the dots. Each dot is a record. Each dot is a vehicle waypoint that, you know, tells us I was here at this moment in time. So um, this is a trip. So a trip, of course, starts with an origin. We have a number of waypoints, and then we end at a destination. It's not always possible to generate trip information from, from waypoints. So that's, there's lots of interesting challenges. And what you see here, Weijo is unusual in that they've time synchronized the, the frequency of which they report. So they, they, they send out a ping every three seconds. Um, and they get that they get 85% of their pings they get to us on our servers within 15 seconds. So what you see here again, you know, blue green is the higher speeds. Here you see a larger distance between the dots than you know on the red area over here. So um, and these things that you see over here, um, it's possible the vehicle was on a ferry. It's more likely uh, there's a GPS problem. So if you start to work with a billion data points, there's always a couple of them, just a handful or so that are inaccurate. Um, and those are interesting challenges. We, we never deliver um, our solution with just the data from the data aggregator. We always fuse the data with data from other sources. And this gives you a little bit of an overview of all the different data types that we can merge. Um, usually it's just two or three or four or five data sets that are being merged. Um, but just to go through it, maps, we work with OpenStreetMaps, of course, but also with Esri. Uh, we can work with Google and Bing Maps as well. Um, we, we not only use the maps as a background layer, but we snap the waypoints to roads. So you can work with the roads. Um, then there's data from public transit buses. It com can come into um, GTFS, which is the schema. It can be GTFS real-time vehicle movement, which are updates in real time about the vehicle movement. Um, but they're usually 30 to 90 seconds behind. Um, and then it can be CAD AVL data, that is system that is data directly from 
the CAD AVL system on the bus. Uh, local data, incident data. Uh, we recently did a project where we ingested 10 years of uh, text dot incident data and compared it to video data. Um, you can also think about local data such as when was it game day? So, um, and as you can imagine, in some places, um, you know, when, when, when ducks play, um, you know, another team, um, th there could be a little bit of congestion there. So, uh, census data, weather data, we can combine, for instance, income levels from census data with trip data and give you an idea or give our users an idea about uh, equ social equity. Uh, weather data, very important, as all of you know, um, road conditions very different, travel times are very different, congestion is taking place in different spots depending on the weather. Uh, so what we can do is we can merge that so you can basically start to ask the system questions such as show me the travel times during icy days or during race or rainy days. Only give me the waypoints for days where precipitation was at least so and so much. Um, Zonal systems, you know, Tiger, TAZs, uh, local zones can be combined. Uh, that allows us to generate information such as how many people drove from Eugene to Corvallis in the morning peak and in the evening peak. Um, vehicle data, so this, this starts to get a little bit into the infrastructure or into the ecosystem of what's, what's uh, you know, um, emerging right now. So the way the system works is the OEMs, um, generate data, uh, mobile device apps generate data, and the OEMs, you know, in, in this case, in this box, the OEMs work with a number of data aggregators. Uh, there's three major ones right now, Wejo, Inrix, and Autonomo. Um, so each of them work with different OEMs um, or with different fleet software providers, and they assemble the data. The way the system works is we actually license the data from a Wejo or from an Inrix, depending on the project. We fuse it with these other data sources, and then we give access to the platform um, through our user interface. Not only can we provide a user interface, we can also provide APIs to allow other software developers to create their own dashboards against our data and, and combine it you know, for their specific functionality. Uh, Location-based services, mobile apps, you know, bikes, pedestrians, a um, whole bunch of completely different challenges there. Counts, camera data, everybody wants to know in real time what the volume estimates are. Nobody has a good solution for that yet. Um, DOT GIS systems, we can pull information from a GIS system of a DOT or a city or an MPO and use that you know, for zonal meshes or for shapes or for, you know, we could even use their road systems if that's what they prefer. Uh, models, we can, and these are bi-directional um, arrows. Um, that's not an accident. So we can actually pull data in from models. So a model can give you predictions of vehicle movement on a you know, second by second or 10 second by 10 second basis, we can pull that in, we can combine it with um, you know, reality, if you like, with measurements from, uh, <clears throat> from the probe providers. We can also push data out to models. So this is a little bit of an overview of how we see the world. Um, here are some uh, real-time examples. So here, Wejo journey data is combined with OpenStreetMaps. It's visualized by uh, the counts. And so the counts are used in two ways. We make a line thicker if there is more traffic on it. And the, the blue lines, lower traffic volumes, um, you know, purple higher, yellow highest. And keep in mind, these aren't the actual traffic volumes. These are the probe volumes. So this is what we see. And you see the dots here have been aggregated to lines. Um, you can switch the background layer. So here um, we're pulling a background information from Esri satellite imagery. And so, you know, that gives you a lot of information about, well, what does it actually look like uh, right there? Is it a mountainous area or not? Um, we can integrate with uh, other image layers. So here what we did is we pulled 
a NASA imagery, they have a very nice library of cloud coverage um, or anywhere in the US um, on a high level, haha. -ha. Um, so <laughs> I couldn't resist. So what we can do, and they have it for every day. So we can synchronize that automatically. We can basically say, and this is Hurricane Sally, um, you know, landing in uh, Mobile and uh, Alabama on September 16th, I think uh, last year. So the data that you see, the data points as data from Rejo, that was the vehicle movement at the moment that this cloud, this, this hurricane was hitting. Um, what we did, we did a project for the East Coast, which, which I'll, I'll, I'll use an example later on, where we combined volume counts, uh, historic, with Weijo data to make an estimate of volumes in real time. So um, that's an example here. Um, this is an example, Portland, combining Weijo moving, moving objects with TriMet buses. The yellow dots are the buses and the red dots are the, the vehicles from uh, Weijo. Um, they have other data sets as well. Weijo and a number of other suppliers are now coming with um, data that isn't derived, that isn't journey derived data, but it's derived from the engine. You know, when a, in this case, if the deceleration or acceleration was over 2.67 meters per second, it flags it as a harsh acceleration or deceleration. And then the light dots are the accelerations and the purple dots are the decelerations. You can zoom in again, it's a completely interactive system where you can define both your space just by moving in and zooming in and panning like you do in, in Google Maps. And you can move in time. So you can look at a time range um, or you can look at a specific moment in time. So what you see here zoomed in and, and here we combine those two things. So here you see hard accelerations and a lot of code people will recognize this is I-405. This is the entry into the tunnel towards Beaverton coming slow speeds. Red is slow speeds from the journey data from them. Um, quick accelerations, higher speeds, merging in with this other uh, feed and a lot of quick decelerations because they merge, which is exactly what you expect. Coming out of the tunnel, taking the off ramp and not having an idea, there's a downtown in front of you with a traffic light and slamming the brakes over here on that bridge, stopping for the traffic light, speeding up. So all of those things, you know, make, make complete sense. Um, here's, there's enormous challenges. So what we did here is we combined it with 10 years of tax dot incidents. Um, as a lot of you people, you know, among you will know, these data sets are usually running two or three years behind and they are not made for these types of analysis. The, the yellow dots are tax dot incident uh, data sets that are snapped to the center line of the freeway. You don't know which direction it was happening in. <laughs> These are minor data challenges that you run into. Um, so this, this is sort of how we uh, view the world based on the different sources of data that exist and what you can do with it, with it for analytics. So, um, Location-based services apps that generate, you know, nine, nine data points a day. Um, we believe there's not much you can do with it for transportation analytics. You, you cannot even determine um, a home location or, you know, when a trip started. The, the high, higher frequency location-based services apps, they generate a point every two to 10 minutes. Um, you know, Unicast is an example of a supplier. Now you can do uh, an exact trajectory because you can generate that using a routing engine. It's not exact, but you can make an estimate. Full OD, it works for very well. Um, partial OD, not so much because if there's two or three parallel roads, you actually don't know which one was taken. Um, low frequency, um, uh, connected vehicle data suppliers are INRIX and Autonomo, a 30 to 90 second frequency interval. Um, 
the source devices are OEM, so on board, you know, car manufacturer generated data, as well as, you know, mobile apps and fleet software. The exact trajectory can now be estimated. You have a high enough uh, temporal frequency. Full trip OD, absolutely. Partial trip OD, you have a reasonable accent, uh, estimate. And then the, the really exciting stuff, the high frequency connected vehicle data. So one to five second interval, um, <clears throat> Weijo is at three. So this is connected vehicle, public transit fleet, uh, TNCs, although TNCs don't share this data. Um, Weijo um, is one of the, is the main supplier right now for this level of data um, from passenger vehicles. They don't have trucks. Um, in it, clever devices, trapeze are some of the major uh, CAT AVL systems. The exact trajectory is known. Full TRIP OD is known. And partial TRIP OD is, is pretty darn ex exact. And so you can use this for corridor um, uh, analysis and you can use it for um, you know, evaluating your, your signal timing plans uh, that are coordinated in a corridor. So um, some of the other application fields, speeds, travel times, uh, safety, uh, again, I don't really see much need. I, I don't see much usability in the low frequency LBS uh, mobile data. Um, high frequency, we start to do it. Exact speeds, you have rough estimates per road segments. Travel times, yes, from O to D. Uh, usually they run about six hours behind, if not more, from getting you the data. Um, you can't use it to see congestion, incidents, blockage. You can't use it for safety analytics, uh, in my opinion. So uh, low frequency connected fecal data. Um, again, you know, 30 to 90 second interval, good estimates per road segments. Um, none of these guys are providing, yeah, no, autonomous is providing in real time. Um, you can now start to recognize congestion on a per road segment basis. These data sets are not working within the road segment, which means you can't really use it for safety analytics. Uh, the high frequency data, now you're there, um, one second to five second intervals. Now you can see the exact speed changes within a road segment. You can see lane changes, you can see heading changes. Um, some of those guys like Rejo um, and also uh, some of the public transit um, organizations can provide this in real time. Um, now you can start to detect congestion incidents and such within road segments. You can do safety analytics as well. So different types of data allow for different types of uh, analytics. So um, number of devices, just a quick reference. Um, Always watch out if you look at the high frequency uh, LBS, serve, uh, LBS apps. A lot of people will say, oh, we have 100 million um, mobile devices we track. Yes, you do, uh, but only two to 10% of your data is useful, is usable. And so you're really looking at you know, 10 to the seventh number of, of <clears throat> original data points per day. Here, you know, my estimate is, <clears throat> excuse me, 15 to 20 million um, usable devices per uh, per day. And over here, the high frequency data, you know, you can use all of the data that you that you get. So um, use case examples, off to the fun stuff. <clears throat> high frequency means you can see those uh, movement changes within, within the, the road segments. And this is an interesting example. As a lot of you will recognize, this is Vancouver, Washington, uh, <clears throat> Columbia River. This is always congested in the morning. So here, this person um, wanted to go here, but instead, you know, took this off ramp, <clears throat> drove through downtown, crossed the bridge, crossed the, crossed the bridge once more. And then, you know, just imagine the extra amount of uh, GHG that was generated by this, and the extra <coughs> load on the, on the road system. High frequency data, you can start to recognize lanes. You can start to see merging patterns between um, lanes merging into, into each other. 
So, you know, you, you can do analysis on that level. Um, within our system, we, we retain the original probe points. So you can work with the points, which is relevant if you want to look at very, uh, you know, micro, micro level problems. We aggregate all of the data to the road segments. We usually use OSM. Um, and then you now you're working with the averages. You can't see merging patterns anymore. You don't see changes, you know, speed changes between lanes, but it's a lot easier to work with. Um, and you can work with areas. So, you know, we area snap all of the data as it's coming in. Um, so you can ask it questions like, hey, <clears throat> from this zip code in the morning, people, where are people going to? You know, stuff like that. Um, so like link analysis, what I show here is we clicked on this um, road here and then we looked where traffic was coming from, both, you know, visualized, this is again, this is the number of probes and the percentages. And of course, you can also see where traffic is going to. Um, and that's what you see here. So again, same link. And this is where they were, were driving towards. And then the third thing, of course, is you can generate OD information from that. Um, at any, any level, actually, uh, over here, it's done by city. This is a San Antonio, uh, Texas example. Um, this can be done at the TAZ level, of course, and then you're gonna get you know, hundreds of thousands of OD pairs. Um, we work with dozens of variables. We enrich the data always when it comes in. It's a point and click interface. I wanna look at Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I define what is my morning peak um, and then the map and the charts and the graphs update automatically. And you can set your time range. So you can basically just without having to write a single line of SQL code, you can basically say for the last three months, I wanna look at the morning peak, midday weekdays, what was happening here. You can also combine that with geospatial filters, again, Portland, Oregon. So here the user is drawing a polygon around the downtown uh, Portland area. Uh, then you can look at all the waypoints in the polygon or all the waypoints are passing through. All waypoints for all trips that were in this polygon at that point in time. Some of the more advanced functionality uh, that we have over here, we defined three um, pass-through filters in the eastbound uh, direction across the Hudson River, defined nine across the East River, and then we created what's called a filter network. So you have to go through here, then to Manhattan and the Bronx, not that you would have a choice, and then any of these bridges. And this is all the OD information that rolls out. Um, you can do this at this macro level. You can do it at an intersection level as well. So this is, uh, this is technology that the functionality is applicable to, to both uh, situations. This was a real fun project. This is Clark County, uh, Washington. Um, this was a situation where all these folks here are uh, <clears throat> transportation engineering consultants. Um, these are folks from DKS. This is from D, uh, David Evans. Um, these are all the different agencies. You know, this gentleman is City of Vancouver. This is Washington. Um, this is RTC. In the center screen, we were running our uh, DB for IoT technology. These folks would ask questions such as this or this on-ramp morning peak. Can you show me where people were coming from? Why are they not taking this other on-ramp? And they had never had a situation where they, in this case, they had, um, I think, 5 million trips. This is a couple of years ago, so the data was small. Uh -huh. um, 5 million trips, one year of data, and that was coming from INRIX. Um, and they could ask these questions interactively and then uh, myself or you know one of the, the transportation engineers from um, the consultants would answer that within a couple of minutes. So getting to a project that we just recently completed, we were asked to look at um, hurricane evacuation and transportation in real time. Um, we were given access, we were getting a data feed of um, probably two and a half billion waypoints per day, seven and a half million trips, two and a half million vehicles a day. Um, during peak hours, we would have between 100 and 200,000 updates. 
individual vehicle updates per second sustained. Um, it was 50 gigabytes a day in data that we generated. Um, <clears throat> we ran all of this on a single server. And that was, that's really the, the power and, and the challenge that we have. So let's take a little quick look at what we were doing. Um, so this is Hurricane Sally uh, passing over the Florida Keys. This was uh, September 11th. So this is the next two days later. So you see it's now over the Keys. The next hurricane is forming. This is all last September. And this is the Weijo data of the, 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 all those cars that are just humming along. And this is the, you know, the hurricane coming up. Um, so the, the 14th, you see a Sally is now here and is really closing in on that coast. Um, so, and then, you know, zooming in further, this is the 15th, you know, it didn't, didn't change too much. Um, and then, <clears throat> now it lands. So now you see the eye is over here and it's landing, you know, on uh, in Mobile, Alabama on the morning of uh, the 16th. Zoom in on in detail. Um, so you see there is still vehicle movement over here. And, but the speeds are low, speeds are higher further out. Um, and then when you zoom in, you, you can really start to see um, you know, some of the stuff that's happening. And then what we did, um, what we did here <clears throat> on the next screen, um, and you see these, this is the coast. I mean, these guys are living on the water, right? So they are taking the hit. Um, so this is an image that shows you, um, we have the ability to, to split the screen in two or four um, screens and look at either the same or different data sets or superimpose them. This is the situation um, one week. Uh, this is the situation during Hurricane um, Sally and the movement patterns and the clouds. This is situation, this is the clouds, and this is the movement pattern a week earlier, exact same time slot. And then let me turn off the clouds and use a black background. And now you start to see the differences. So this is, the traffic from 5.30 on the 16th to 6.30 on the 16th. Um, you see there is no movement here. This is a freeway. Um, there's no movement there at all. Whereas you see high, you know, high, higher speeds over here. Um, very interesting. Uh, we don't know why. Lots of people turned on their engine. So did they try to get away the last minute and they couldn't get anywhere? Did they load their their phones because they lost power I, we don't know you know and, and these are the interesting things to to start looking at um, if you have local knowledge you know one of the things that, that they really wanted to know is we put out these evacuation orders when do people actually leave so this is the transportation as it was um the days uh, around the hurricane and you see huge drop um, two days before the hurricane hit. Um, and then over here, this is the traffic volume on this freeway on a normal day. You know, this is a traffic volume the day before Sally and realize this is going up to 40. The other one was going up to 200. So it's the peak is already just a fifth of what it was. This is the traffic volume the day Sally made fit landfall. No traffic in that morning peak, almost none. And then in the afternoon, it, it starts to come up again. And then, you know, here are my last slides. Uh, most people actually, so this is what we did. We drew a polygon around this area here, looked at inflow versus outflow, plotted that out. <clears throat> and this is what you see, enormous outflow the days before. And then a day after people start coming back, you know. And so those are the types of insights that you can derive. You can also see where they were going to, from which county to which county. Um, and then you can look at, you know, this is the Pensacola Bay traffic uh, on, you know, September 16th, the day it made landfall. And these are just a couple of peaks. These are, you know, two vehicles. 
and this is on uh, on the week earlier same same time comparisons. So you you see there is an enormous uh, difference uh, between them. So. This is my, um, almost my last slide. And this is also a personal request. You know, the, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of our biggest challenges is um, we speak data, transportation and, and engineers speak transportation. To talk to each other is actually quite difficult. And what we need is we need people who understand both disciplines, um, you know, and, and can bridge it. And then this is the actual uh, life system. This is uh, data from uh, Regio in, uh, in Dallas. Um, and what we can do, as I said, not only look at a time range, but also as a snapshot, and we can animate that. So what I'm doing here is every second, I'm moving three seconds forward. Um, and by the way, this is a completely interactive uh, environment. So, so. Did I, did I bridge enough subjects in 30 minutes? <laughs> that was absolutely exceptional. And, and why don't we pause just for a moment and, and, and let's share a round of applause for just a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, not as compelling as it should be if we were in person, but lots of <laughs> I, I, I know that everyone was as riveted on the edge of their seat as I was. So, so th thank you so much for, for preparing those, those comments and remarks. That, that was an exceptional uh, call to action to, to end on. Um, and, and so what I'm going to task the students with is start thinking about a few questions that we can ask in, in our last few minutes, and, and I'll warm us up with a question or two. Um, so uh, I'll draw a connection. Interestingly, last week in our seminar, we had one of our, our newest graduate students, Brian Stays, who, who's on the line here with us, presented the results of his master's thesis. And interestingly, that thesis was focused on considering queuing theory during hurricane evacuation scenarios in the state of Florida. And ah. so we, we were just <laughs> thinking about this very important question from the perspective of in pavement loops and the queues that accumulate over storm experiences that can run, you know, tens of hours in duration. And, and so th th this was an exceptional example to map against what we were chatting about last week. It's very possible Brian will have some questions for you there. My, yeah, my first, it away. My, my first question would be, um, in talking about the latencies with which data becomes available to, to you and your archive, and your visions for how the archive can be utilized by decision makers, it, it sounds like there are perhaps two perspectives, two perspectives, if I'm understanding correctly. It seems like you have the potential to build dashboards for uh, agencies and managers of systems that could provide perhaps some near real-time decision relevant information and, and also the ability to analyze data historically for analyses. It, it, am I understanding that that vision correctly? That Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so what we do is, um, you know, for what we do is we, we can ingest the data in real time. Um, we retain all of it. Um, we can combine it with historic data later on. And we retain that as well. And then you can run your anal analyses against the combination of the two. So the, the answer is yes. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> the plan here. Um, so and one of the things that, that, that you know, we haven't done yet, but I, I absolutely see that um, there's a need to go there is to say, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm seeing this travel time on this corridor. Um, what was it the last four Wednesdays at 3.30 in the afternoon? And what does this mean, the current condition mean for the, the situation 30 minutes from now? You know, so a um, very simple example, of course, is if you can de detect incidents in real time, you have probably 15 minutes before everything is completely mucked up and there's nothing you can do. Can you see where the traffic that is 15 minutes out and 10 minutes out of the incident, where it wants to go to and reroute it around the incident in time? You only have 15 minutes. So, you know, that, and, and no one has, to my knowledge, no one has solved this, right? But it's just an example of combining deriving yeah. information from historic data sets, combining it with current data sets, 
and speed for this example, speed is everything. So if it takes you 30 minutes to predict what's happening in 15 minutes from now, your value add is limited. We, it, it, interesting, and in keeping with your themes of trying to connect c computer science experts with, with folks in, it, who are embedded in the transportation domain, one of our current MS students, Charles Cole, is a computer science undergraduate who, who's studying his MS now in the transportation engineering domain, and he's posed the question, when collecting data from various data providers, uh, we, Joe, and others, do you consider the possibility of duplicated vehicle trips across oh, yeah. some different data feeds that are, that are coming in? It's a big here? problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, no, spot on. So, so first of all, the, the OEM data is unique. You know, that there's, there's uh, we don't have a situation yet where there's one OEM feeding into multiple data aggregators. So these guys have their own suppliers. So there it's easy. Mobile apps, um, we don't know if a mobile app is on a vehicle that we have data on. The intervals are different. The time clocks may not be completely synchronized. There's no way of knowing. Now, if your mobile device has three apps that are LBS, and they are all three feeding that, there is a unique identifier. And so we can zip that out. If you're sitting in your car with an iPhone and an iPad and an Android device, there is no way we can figure out you're, you're generating that data three times. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's this beautiful example or, or anecdote, you know, don't know if it's true um, of, of a gentleman, you know, getting, you know, uh, 30 Android phones and walking down, walking down a major corridor and then seeing that Waze is starting to reroute everybody around that corridor. So, because Waze thinks traffic's slow there. <laughs> so, no. So, um, absolutely true. Excellent. We've We've got another interesting comment related to data sources again. And, and so Jay Kim, one of our MS students is, is asking, so uh, it seems like there are many different sources of data that you've, you've connected into in your archive. Um, we're guessing that not all of them or, or not all of them are in the public sector. So are, are some of these sources uh, open source or are you purchasing access to different threads or is it a combination of, of, of those two? A combination. So, you know, GTFS is open. Open. So, and GTFS real time vehicle feeds is open, uh, but it's the data is fairly poor. Um, the census data is open, uh, OSM is open. So, but most of the other sources are um, are proprietary. So, so basically, the you know the biggest expenses for some of these projects is in licensing the data. So now, in many cases, like the CAD AVL data is not open, but if the customer is TriMet, that they own the data in principle, uh, depending on the agreements that they have. In, in their case, they own the data. So for them, that data is free. Uh, incident data is often um, publicly available, although it's running two years behind, um, if you're lucky. So <laughs> just kidding. Um, so uh, weather data, if you want it real time, you have to pay for it. So, yeah, so it's a combination of, of those. And the costs can be substantial, but the insights you derive from it are also at a completely, I mean, we're doing a project now where we're uh, working on um, uh, analyzing corridor uh, signalized, uh, coordinated signalized uh, intersections. If you want to do that with floating car data, how many data points do you have? How representative is it? It is, you know, if you have 60 data points collected over two afternoons, you know, whatever. We're supplying, you know, tens of thousands of records. Um, but, you know, and a very interesting use case is before, during, and after scenarios where you look at the before travel pattern, you changed something, whether it's an on-ramp meter or a, um, a signal timing plan, or you closed a, an off-ramp during construction. So with, with the real-time data, you can, or even with next day data, you can see, okay, I closed an off-ramp here. What did that mean for 
for patterns, which for which area to which area were the travel times increased. So, yeah. We had a question from Dr. Hernandez, one of our resident statistical experts. Uh oh. Help. Are there <laughs> are there situations where you're trying to address a problem, uh, and for that particular performance measure that you need to address, or or to answer the question that's being posed to you, you're running into issues of sample size where you oh uh, all the time yes, <laughs> <laughs> and there are there are situations, um, but 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 do, do keep in mind that's a temporary problem to a great extent. You know, so the connected vehicle technology is trickling down. Uh, where's my 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 Weijo, uh slide? Uh, this one over here. So within a few years, you know, all of the vehicles that are coming off of the factory floor are connected. Um, you know, so many people are already walking around with you know LBS devices. So. But yes, there are, there, and there have been situations, and I'm not going to go into details, where the client rejected the results because the, the sample size was just insufficient. And that is, that is absolutely true. So I, I very much, uh, I could not concur more strongly with your assessment here. Uh, everyone that, that I talk to and interact with that's doing work nominally in this space anticipates the ubiquity of connected information right. Right. Uh, to occur much, much quicker, orders of magnitude quicker than we will be able to sort of fully automate transportation systems. Right. On, the, on there the is, side of yeah. Now to that subject, there is one, there's one thing which we always struggle with. It's like, so there's situations where we say, oh, here's a million trips. You've never had access to a million trips. And then the transportation planners say, well, yeah, but is it statistically significant? I mean, what is the distribution? And I go like, well, what data did you have before? Well, uh, we had a thousand trips. I said, well, how statistically significant was that? We don't know. <laughs> so there's always, there's this as well. But again, you, yeah. you got a you got a laugh reaction from our statistician there. Uh, okay. that, that, is that, is, that is absolutely spot on. He, he, right. he, he could not agree more. Right. And, and so uh, we're We've, we've already held you a little bit longer than we had no anticipated. Yeah. And so what I'd like to do is let's have one more round of applause for just a wonderful sequence of Q&A. Thank, thank you so much for uh, sharing a little bit more of your insights with, with some of our questions and for, for spending some time with our students. We genuinely could, could not be more appreciative of it. Yeah. Well, oh, thank you, David. Thanks for inviting me. And if you guys have any questions or suggestions, you know, feel free to email uh, me or Wander and uh, we'll get back to you. Um, absolutely. So cool. That's fantastic. So, so we'll go ahead and, and close it there and, and say, gosh, everyone have an exceptional weekend and, and thanks for ending your week with us in, in seminar. That, that was yeah. just fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, David. Thanks everybody else for so long, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye.